Good morning, everyone. Uh, let me just introduce the uh, speakers of this morning. Uh, you already noticed our strong feminist orientation <laughs> yesterday. Um, and this feminist uh, orientation is continued today. First speaker will be my dear old friend, uh, Deanna Forbush, um, who's, who's a lawyer specializing in labor law. She's also the wife of Doug French. And uh, I should mention that uh, Doug and Deanna got married here in Bodrum during one of our conventions. Um, the second speaker will be uh, Enrico Colombato, who is professor of economics at the University of Torino in Italy. And uh, the third speaker is uh, Andrew Schuen, uh, who is a co-founder of the Lion Rock Institute, a free market institute in Hong Kong. He's a financial analyst, and he's the, the commander of the Silver Legion Volunteers, which is a place that uh, buys and stores silver in Hong Kong, I assume. So, Deanna, please. Thank you, Hans. And thank you, Hans and Guchen, for inviting me to speak today. Um, as I think I mentioned yesterday, my husband and I were here at the very first Property and Freedom Conference uh, back in 2006, and it's an absolute honor to be asked to come back here all these years later. I don't know where the time's gone by, but to celebrate the 10th anniversary. Um, as Hans mentioned, uh, if any of you were here during this, the sixth conference in 2011, you'll know that I got married here and Douglas French got married here. Um, of course, while I was immersing myself in the uh, spiritual ceremonies, my husband was being entertained by what he calls <laughs> the, the local talent. Uh, but the next night we had a proper uh, elegant European wedding and it was a year I'll never forget. And in fact, it's the year that I think Leah Glody uh, pr uh, proposed to Donna. Of course, they got, whoops, mm -hmm. <laughs> they got married in Las Vegas, as did the doctors Hoppe. But don't let all this uh, discussion about marriage or all these marriages concern you, because as Hans told Doug back in the day, marriage existed long before the state did. So I think that's the only way you got Doug to marry me. But <laughs> 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 nevertheless, I'm here today to talk about uh, violence in American unions. And uh, because I'm going to primarily speak about American unions, uh, I think I should distinguish a little bit between American unions and European ones. Um, in the States, labor unions are considered to be uh, third-party entities that interfere between an employer and their employees, that impede uh, their ability to have uh, good conversation and good communication, that create work stoppages, that impose um, all kinds of crushing work rules and uh, expensive benefits, and prevent employers from terminating at will. But moreover, in the United States, uh, labor unions will, in my opinion, stop at nothing to get a foothold in a company's uh, front door. And I, I guess I should tell you that anything I tell you today is based on either my own experience or my own well-informed opinion. Uh, so, But in my opinion, in the labor unions in the United States are uh, impede business, and that's the way they're viewed by most employers. In Europe, on the other hand, and particularly in the Germanic and Scandinavian companies, unions are more like uh, works councils. They are more, um, they form more of an alliance with the company, and, and they actually act as, they, as a liaise between the employers and the employees. Um, they can strike, but they usually don't. Uh, when they do, they try to find the most disrupt, uh, least disruptive way to do it. Some, uh, some labor unions in Europe have been known to strike on lunch and then to go back dutifully to their, their jobs. Um, even when uh, the tube in London goes on strike, it's two or three days of a work stoppage, and that's it. Nothing like you see in the States. Uh, so any kind of 
of uh, work disruption is very minimal in, in the European Labour Work Councils. And in general, uh, the European Work Councils are very careful not to put the company or the employees' jobs in jeopardy. That's why when Volkswagen uh, started a, or decided to build a factory in Chattanooga, Tennessee, the first thing they did was invite the UAW to come and form a union and hold an election. Um, they did that because they believe that their uh, culture of worker code determination is actually a competitive advantage. They uh, believe that having a work council uh, in the factory promotes productivity and management flexibility. And why? Because in Europe, work councils are at least as worried about the well-being of the company and the stability of jobs as are the uh, companies themselves. But that's not always the case in the United States. Um, in the United States, labor unions are not always so worried about the rank and file uh, employees. They're tremendously politically powerful organizations. And um, at times, in my view, they're more interested in wielding that power than in uh, worrying about the financial well-being of corporate America. Um, you might have noticed that uh, we're not producing many car, oh, this is the European labor unions. You can hardly notice they're striking. But uh, you might have noticed that we're not producing too many automobiles in Detroit in these days. And uh, the New York textile industry has been offshored. Uh, they're not making any textiles in New York City anymore, uh, or not many. And the uh, Pittsburgh idle steel mills have been turned into now failing casinos, all because most of the world's steel production is being done in China or India or Russia. Even Turkey's uh, crude steel production has gone up by 23%, not so in the United States. And the primary reason for the demise of these formerly robust American industries are labor unions. In my own town, I watched uh, labor unions put unreasonable pressure on companies, and uh, like the Hacienda, the El Rancho, I don't know if any of you guys, old timers, have remember these from Vegas's old days, uh, but the Landmark and the Frontier. Um, all these properties are closed. They've closed their doors, due in part at least uh, to the union's unreasonable demands and absolute refusal to grant concessions. Um, when the Culinary Workers Union started their organizational effort at the Venetian uh, Hotel in Las Vegas, they said that Las Vegas is the new Detroit. They've already destroyed Detroit. We're not making cars there anymore. So now they say Las Vegas is the new Detroit. And by that, they mean Las Vegas is a union town, that the union controls the gaming and hospitality industry. And if anybody wants to operate there, they'll do so uh, based on the union's terms, or they can leave town. That's their attitude. Um, uh, the unions are, are particularly powerful in Las Vegas, and that's because you can't offshore the hospitality industry. Um, as you know, we actually need people to uh, make beds and prepare food and serve the occasional cocktail. And um, so now that the uh, culinary union controls that industry, they know how powerful they are. So when they went to Sheldon Adelson, the owner and developer of the Venetian, um, they told him he could sign the neutrality agreement or he could take his billions of dollars and thousands of jobs that he intended to create and leave town. There was no compromise, either take their terms or leave. You know, they could care less about the, the money that would be spent on the community. So, of course, uh, Mr. Adelson declined, and he instead put together a pretty powerful team, and he gave them one marching order, and that was, if the Culinary Workers Union is going to represent my employees, please make sure that they get a secret ballot election before they do. So I was very happy to join that team, but before I could, I had to pay my own form of dues, not union dues, but to the kind that leave bruises. Uh, but I began my career uh, as a union attorney in Philadelphia. So that's a big transformation. But uh, I came from a blue collar family. And uh, at the time, I felt that there was a place for organized labor. Um, after all, thanks to Jimmy Hoffa, over the road truckers were no longer burning themselves with cigarettes going down the road trying to stay awake for the 18 hour haul. Uh, children were no longer uh, being trapped in hot factories because Organized labor had helped pass OSHA regulations and uh, child labor laws. Uh, the Fair Labor Standard Act has been passed by, in part by union efforts, uh, making sure that hourly employees now have a 40-hour work week or get paid overtime. 
And in any event, in my overall philosophy at that time was that the working man needed this kind of representation to get a fair shake. Um, of course, it didn't take me very long. I was very young. It didn't take me very long to, to learn the errors of my way. Um, and I never, uh, it all started when I lost my first labor arbitration case. I was a young lawyer in Philadelphia, had won every case I'd ever tried. Um, every employee I ever advocated for got put back to work. Uh, but one day, uh, after putting on a very, uh, what I thought was a very vigorous defense, I was told on the way back to the office by the union rep that I was going to lose the case. I said, how am I going to lose? I think, you know, this is a winner. He said, no, uh, it was predetermined. The arbitrator wrote the decision before you ever put the case on. And um, we just owed one to the company, and his attitude was the employee was expendable, and uh, we lost that case. And uh, be because they, they, you know, they had made a deal with the company, and the employee could just be, you know, the collateral loss. Um, I think more than furious, I was absolutely crushed. To part of my, uh, you know, belief in America had been crushed um, because I learned that uh, union representation is not all it's cracked up to be. Um, it's unions are far more interested in representing their own interests in the United States than they are uh, interests of their employees. So it was about this time that I met Tom Alardi, uh, whose family owns casinos in Las Vegas, and particularly they owned the Frontier Hotel and Gambling Hall. They were looking for an attorney to help them survive what was then a four-year strike. Um, <coughs> So I told Tom, you know, you don't want me because I'm a union lawyer and you need a management lawyer so that you can trust the advice they give you. And he said, no, I think I do want you because given your background, you'll help me protect my employees. So uh, if I'd only known that by um, taking his offer that I would be magically transformed from this ardent uh, union attorney to a now a zealous management lawyer, um, I, I don't know what I would have done. I think, uh, I guess I'm happy that I took that job and I've explained the transformation by really adapting one of Winston Churchill's quotes. Um, and I say, well, if you're not progressive when you're young, you probably don't have a heart. But if you're not a libertarian when you get older, you probably don't have a brain. So uh, I finally grew a brain, um, thankfully. And I think my philosophy completely changed when uh, I learned that the frontier strike was was caused because the Alardis wanted to actually provide their employees more benefits, better benefits than the union contract allowed. Uh, Margaret Alardi, the matriarch of the family, uh, made her fortune the old-fashioned way by churning real estate in California and Nevada. And um, she was a friend of Benny Benyon's who started the famous Benyon Horseshoe down downtown Las Vegas, and he said, you know, Margaret, you should buy uh, the Pioneer Club. Pioneer Clubs are the, the one where the cowboy is saying howdy as you come to town. So she bought that club downtown and the one in Laughlin, and, you know, she's a very astute businesswoman, and it didn't take her long to learn that, you know, the gambling business was a pretty slick way to make a lot of money, and she did that. She made a lot of money, and uh, she sold the Pioneer Clubs and moved to the Las Vegas Strip. So when I say Las Vegas Strip today, that and I might say Las Vegas Boulevard, those are synonyms, the same main road down the fancy part of where all the big new modern casinos are, Las Vegas Strip or Boulevard. So she bought the Frontier uh, right on the Las Vegas Strip with 35 acres of frontage, strip frontage property uh, from the Howard Hughes Corporation for $22 million. So rough math there is about $600,000 an acre. Uh, this is in 1988. Now, the Frontier had a union contract when she bought it, and uh, she was correctly advised that when the contract expires, she'll be, she would be able to renegotiate the terms. So she had the collective bargaining agreement analyzed, and she found that she was extraordinarily overpaying for subpar benefits. And so she went to an advisor and, and learned that she could provide a better benefit package, uh, plus put, put aside a Christmas fund for each and every employee that they could cash out at the end of the year for less money than she was paying the union for these inferior benefits. So when the time came, she went to the union and she said, uh, this is what I want to do. If you allow me to do it, then I'll go ahead and renew the collective bargaining agreement. So 
after they pulled themselves up off the floor from, uh, you know, laughter, they then told her, well, that's a very nice try, but, uh, you know, that's not going to happen. And she quickly learned that in culinary union land, the right to renegotiate exists only in legal textbooks. Um, they told her if she wanted the privilege of operating on the Las Vegas Strip, and apparently they were the only ones that could grant the privilege, that she would have to sign the Strip contract, which is their uniform contract, uh, or sell to someone that would. So she also declined, and um, she did what the law permits, which is bargain to impasse, and then uh, implemented her last, best, and final offer. The employees got uh, better benefits and a Christmas fund, but the union was furious. They were uh, furious by the Ilardi's audacity. They convinced the employees that they should walk out. Um, they said, if you walk out in solidarity, it has to be done so that we can maintain the status quo, their benefit funds, um, and uh, we'll have you back to work in two or three days. Um, but they were wrong. The uh, frontier strike and the picketers stayed out there for six and a half years, while Bill Bennett, who was the owner of the Circus Circus, was giving them three square meals a day, and the union was trying to convince the Alardis, or I say coerce, them into signing uh, the strip contract. For example, they followed the 70-year-old Mrs. Alardi around in her car and terrorized her until she completely stopped driving. They uh, picketed the bank that she helped found uh, until she resigned her position on the board. They scaled the walls of her children's homes and terrorized their families and children. And But moreover, they vilified this respectable family in the media and made them really our community's pariah. And it, that, that's really the saddest part. For example, when I moved to town, uh, there was no law school in Las Vegas, which is what, or in Nevada, which made it such a great place for a lawyer to practice no competition, right, or little competition. Uh, but UNLV, where Professor Hoppe is, has emeritus status, uh, UNLV wanted a law school, so they went out looking for the money, and of course Mrs. Alardi said she would contribute the million dollars, which back in when a million dollars meant something, uh, or more than it does today. Uh, she would donate the money, but she wanted um, the school name for her family. The Culinary Union told UNLV, and they have this much political clout, they told UNLV you can take the money, but you cannot grant the naming rights. And of course, the deal fell through, and now that law school is named after Bill Boyd, her, uh, Mrs. Alardi's competitor. So the message to the Alardi's was clear. This is uh, a posting from the union's website, and um, the message was clear. Shut down or sell, but you're not operating without a union contract. So um, there was a lot of uh, physical violence on the, on the frontier uh, picket line. For example, they formed, the picketers formed human chains and blocked traffic for hours. There were all kinds of fights and fisticuffs and, and general hoodlumism while the police stood by and virtually ignored all this. That is, at least until Sean and Gail White uh, made the mistake of trying to come to the frontier and said to a picketer as they passed by, why don't you get a job? So, of course, that picketer had a huge glass beer stein in his hand, just smashed him over the side of the head with it, and then chased his wife across the street, tackled her, and, and beat her. So, um, that day there was exactly one person arrested, and, uh, of course, the Whites filed a lawsuit against uh, the Culinary Workers Union for assault and battery. But the Culinary Union went to the Whites and said, listen, uh, why don't you just put this litigation on hold and sue uh, the Frontier for negligence? And the theory was that if the, if the Frontier had only signed a union contract, the picketers would not be out on the street and the Whites would not have been harmed. And this argument actually survived summary judgment. So. Um, we learned later that the union had gone to the whites and unethically, and I think illegally, offered uh, to pay them a fixed amount of money if their uh, litigation against the frontier failed, uh, which it did in 1997. We prevailed in that lawsuit, and the union uh, presumably uh, paid their damages, but I, I'm not privy to that information. Um, but that was a very bittersweet day, because that's the day that we learned that Mrs. Alardi had sold the frontier. So 
see, a, a labor strike is supposed to be the ultimate industrial hammer. It's supposed to bring a company to its knees. It's supposed to close the doors and basically coerce the company to come back to the bargaining table. If after six months, a company has not capitulated to a union's demands, the strike has essentially failed. And, and that's just generally understood. This strike went on for six and a half years. This is how strong the Culinary Workers Union is. They knew they had failed, uh, but they weren't going away. And they didn't know what to do. And the only thing they could do was find somebody that would pay this family so much money that they would they would have to take it, and that's exactly what they did. Uh, they found Phil Ruffin, uh, who was the owner of Greyhound uh, Dog Tracks uh, in Kansas and casinos in Bahamas, not the likely guy to get uh, licensed in Las Vegas, but he was willing to pay $167 million for the frontier and their 35 acres, which I think pencils out to be about $4.7 million an acre substantially more than Mrs. Alardi paid. So of course I said she's a savvy businesswoman and she recognized that a $145 million profit in nine uh, fun-filled years was, was an offer that no reasonable person could pass up and she wasn't going to and the union knew she wouldn't. So the hotel closed, Phil Ruffin bought it, uh, and he was flanked by Jesse Jackson and every single politician in town when he opened uh, the property as the uh, new frontier. So the unions got what they wanted. Um, they paid dearly, but the Alardis were out and the union was in. Um, just as an aside, in 2007, Phil Ruffin sold uh, the frontier to El Ad, which is an Israeli company, for $1.2 billion, which is just shy of $25 million an acre. Um, but that was, of course, before the Las Vegas real estate bubble burst. And, um, and just, re in fact, I think that was at the brink of it. My husband would know. But uh, <laughs> uh, El Ad's bankers, now that the bubble has burst and has not really recovered, I don't think, um, El Ad's bankers recently sold the property to James Packard, the Australian billionaire, 53% uh, of the property anyway, for uh, $260 million. Um, the, the bank, uh, Oak Tree Financial, kept the other 47% of the deal. So it was essentially a $315 million deal or $9 million an acre. So you see the fluctuation over this period. Um, of course, Phil Ruffin was the big winner, uh, but the Alardis aren't going to miss any meals, so uh, they're just fine. Um, when the frontier closed, uh, that was front page news, and Sheldon Adelson called me and said, what does that mean for you? I said, I'm going back to Philadelphia. He said, no, come across the street and help me build the only non-union mega resort on the lost, in the new Detroit. So um, everyone from the governor to the county commissioner to all the politicians and other operators, and of course the union, said this could not be done. But uh, I really, I had been surreptitiously meeting with Mr. Adelson over the years and really liked his style, thought he was gonna be successful. He was an extreme, he is an extremely principled man and, and just wants right to be done. And he didn't want uh, a union representing his employees without a secret ballot election. So, um, I have lots of stories to tell you about him. I think I'm just gonna be able to tell you one. Um, I learned a little bit about his character when he told me uh, uh, how he developed his uh, position on organized labor. He said that when he first bought the Sands Hotel um, in Las Vegas, uh, he, he's a lover of frozen yogurt. So he went downstairs to stand in a long line of people queued up to get frozen yogurt. Uh, and he couldn't understand why the line was moving so slowly. So by the time he got to the front of the line, he could see why, because there was one employee serving the yogurt. Meanwhile, there were three employees just leaned back against the counter doing nothing. So he had just bought the hotel. They didn't know who he was. So he said to the first employee, why aren't you serving these customers? And uh, the employee said, well, sir, you, I'm a, I only stock the shelves. That's all I'm allowed to do. I'm not allowed to do any other, any other type of work. 
he looked at the next one. She said, I'm the cashier. I can only ring up the cell once somebody else serves the yogurt. Um, next one was the supervisor, and she could only stand by and watch the work not being done because the union contract that came with the Sands Hotel had these uh, very strict jurisdictional rules that required that no person in a certain job classification can work in any other job classification, and no supervisor can do any bargaining unit work. So here are, he had this long line of people, all these employees that are on the clock and nobody can do the work, no one can service the customers um, because of the union uh, jurisdictional work rules. So he knew then and there that he could not run a five-star hotel the way he wanted to with restrictive work rules and told the union that he would not sign a neutrality agreement. Uh, if, if they were going to represent his employees, they'd have to do it through a secret ballot election and um, they'd have to offer them more than he was going to and that was unlikely to happen. So. Uh, Maybe during q and I'll tell you more about some of the crazy stories that went on at the, the Venetian after he refused uh, to sign the neutrality agreement, but that's when the battle royale broke out, and, and the mother of the battles took place on uh, the sidewalks in front of the Venetian that run parallel to the Las Vegas Strip. Um, every time the Venetian needed a permit, the union would object. This was their coercive uh, corporate camp, part of their corporate campaign. So what they would do is pack the county commission meetings uh, with hundreds of union members wearing union t-shirts that had the big red check, union yes. So they would all be sitting in the audience as a not so subtle reminder to the county commissioners who got them elected, their 60,000 members could also get them unelected. And, um, so in true fashion, the union opposed the Venetian's uh, petition or application to get a construction permit. They said the anticipated traffic that would come with the new project could not be borne by the Las Vegas Strip. It would be too much for it to handle. So the commissioners forced the Venetian to conduct a uh, traffic impact study. And of course, the impact study found that the anticipated traffic would be much better accommodated if there was a new lane added to the Las Vegas Strip. So the union thought this was a, a big victory. They felt like they had won, that they had, uh, th the project was dead, uh, because how do you add a lane to the Las Vegas Strip? But then the engineers that the Venetian hired said, well, we can put another lane here if we use the land that is currently housing the existing sidewalk. So the Venetian said, okay, well, if you'll widen the boulevard, we'll build a sidewalk on our private property. And, um, uh, and that's what they did. So they said, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll grant a public easement so that the people, the public can traverse the frontage of the property, but it'll be our private sidewalk on our private property. So the easement contained very specific uh, language that we worked on forever. I know quite a bit about this language. And in the easement, uh, the Venetian rate uh, retained full rights inherent to the ownership of private property to the full extent permitted by the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendment of the United States, amendments to the United States Constitution. The Venetian also post, I mean, yeah, the Venetian also posted uh, no trespassing signs and private property signs all the way up and down the sidewalk. If you go there today, you'll see them. They're still there. Beautiful brass plaques. Nevertheless, uh, as soon as the sidewalks were built, Clark County issued a uh, rallying permit to the union so that they could hold a demonstration on the Venetian's private sidewalks. So, of course, we object, the Venetian objected and said, uh, if this rally takes place, we expect you police department, Metro Police Department, to arrest these people for trespass. So the DA issued a statement and he said, well, the police will attend the rally, uh, but there will be no arrest because uh, in his view, the picketers had a cognizable First Amendment defense to any trespassing charge. I don't know how you do that on private property, but that was his view. Um, so on the day of the protest, um, well, these are the guys that you, they couldn't do their job because of the work rules. <laughs> uh, on the day of the protest, this is what it looked like. Uh, the Venetian took several measures to protect its private property. We put up these barricades to mark the property line. Uh, we issued trespassing uh, warnings. Oh, remember these guys, they were doing nothing. Uh, this is me in the fashionable fanny pack uh, issuing trespassing warnings. Um, 
This guy wasn't having any of it. And um, when the police refused to arrest the trespassers, we uh, effected citizens' arrests. This is my friend Dee Taylor in this shot. Um, and arrested them for trespassing. So of course after the rally, the Venetians sued the district attorney, the police department, uh, Clark County, and the unions, and alleged that the government took their property without due process or just compensation. They also alleged that the government impermissibly deprived them of their property rights. Um, the defendants argued that the property had, because of use, the property had become a public forum and the Venetian had lost its right to exclude. So, shockingly, U.S. District Judge Philip Pro agreed with, with the defendants and uh, while acknowledging the general rule that the Constitution does not apply to private conduct generally, uh, he said that this case fell into a very narrow exception that's applied when a private actor performs a function generally performed by the state. Based on this finding, he held that the property looked and functioned like public property, that the area traditionally had been public property, to traditionally had functioned as a public sidewalk, and based on that, the land had become quasi-public, and the First Amendment now attached to the land, and the Venetian had lost the right to exclude. So, of course, we appealed to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, who affirmed the decision, and so uh, we convinced Mr. Adelson this is such an important case. The Supreme Court of the United <coughs> States, the, the highest court of the land, will understand that without property rights, there are no rights. Um, please, you know, finance this appeal, and we filed uh, a writ of certiorari to the United States Supreme Court, and they denied certiorari. So Judge Pro's decision is now the law of the land, and uh, it's, it's all very sad. It's a sad day. Uh, but on the whole, I think this case demonstrates uh, the violence perpetuated by uh, American unions against private property. And um, it's done with impunity in the United States. And I think the case further demonstrates the problem with granting the state the right to protect private property, because that creates a dual-edged sword. If they can protect the private property, they can also take it away, and they can also take it away without uh, due process or just compensation. Uh, so I don't know what else to tell you except uh, caveat emptor. And to my American friends, happy Labor Day.